Erev Tov, everyone. Each of us have an identity that's made up of a lot of different parts, where we're born, where we live, the language we speak, the kind of food we eat, it's countless. Uh, and of course, religion is a component of that too. But before we get into that, imagine, if you will, somebody who moves from Los Angeles, where the, the team that they support is the Dodgers, and they move to Milwaukee. Now you might get a little bit of playful ribbing about supporting the Brewers, but there's really not a big deal if someone switches from one baseball team to the other. And even if someone wants to change a big part of their identity, uh, their nationality, you know, to get a, you know, change of citizenship, there's a little bit more work, but no, there's nothing really wrong with it with, you know, unbelievably rare exception. There's no issue with changing one's, uh, some core parts of identity, but when it comes to religion, things are a little bit different. When it comes to religion, now again, experientially, people change religion and their religious practices all the time, but from the perspective of the formal religions themselves, changing to another religion or another religious practice is much more problematic. It could be seen as a betrayal, um, and in some cases, as even forbidden and not accepted. A community might say, you can say you're not whatever religion you are, whatever, whatever you want to say, but you know what? No matter what, you're still stuck in our religion. But within Judaism, putting that uh, idea aside about changing whole religion, there's one other thing that we're going to focus on tonight, which is another major part of Jewish identity. So now let's look at the whole Jewish people. Let's assume everyone in the Jewish people, we all identify as Jews. I'm oversimplifying. All identify as Jews. All recognize that there are commandments from the Torah, regardless of whether one practices. We recognize there's commandments, and there's something we call halacha, which we see as some sort of legal binding. But beyond that, there's something else very important. Now, when we talked about the development of Jewish law, we talked a lot about this, is that if the Torah gives a mitzvah of eating matzah, then you say, okay, I have a commandment to do that. How much? Is what flavor should it be? What shape should it be? All of these questions. The Torah commands that I shake a lulav. How many times do I shake it? What direction do I shake it? So as we talked about, what happens is eventually traditions, minhagim, types of practices develop about how to fulfill the mitzvah. And the way somebody does it in, in Uruguay is going to be very different from the way somebody does it in Shorewood. And there's nothing wrong with that because these are just different ways of fulfilling something which is obligated. There's a core foundation upon, again, obviously there are exceptions to this and disagreements, but for argument's sake, there's a core that everyone agrees upon the basis of it, don't eat pig. But what about playing the football that's made of pig? Are there different traditions on that in different towns, et cetera? So the answer to all those questions is yes, there's different traditions. However, what if I don't like the tradition I was raised with? What if I disagree about how to shake the lulav? I'm still gonna shake the lulav. I'm still gonna do the mitzvah. I'm still gonna pray. I'm still gonna keep kosher. But I think the way that they do it in Yemen is better than the way that they did it in Poland or in Russia where my family for the most part is from. The question is, can I just change my minhag, my custom? It's not a commandment from God. It's not a legal set of codes um, developed either based on the Torah or based on rabbinic tradition. It's just a custom of how to live a Jewish life. It might be how to pronounce something. We'll get to that in a moment. Can I just change that? I'm not going to say for no reason. I'm going to change it because it means something that makes more sense to me. But can I just change customs? And some of the questions we're going to ask here is about where do customs come from? And also, are there different kinds of customs? Is there a difference between a communal custom, a universal custom, a family custom, etc.? So the core question that I'm going to start with, and then we're going to see if we can answer it by the end of this class, is one, there are many, many well-known uh, differences between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. And the truth is, there's probably more than you're aware of, but less than you imagine. Probably have more in common with Sephardim, uh, at least in terms of the religious sphere, than you would think. Culturally, there might be more differences between, you know, Polish Jews and, and, and Yemenite Jews. But when it comes down to those differences, one of the most famous ones between um, uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, and I will pause for a moment to explain what those terms even mean, um, is eating rice on Pesach. So the idea behind that is the Torah clearly tells us not to eat any food which is fermented chametz. And one of the ways that we do that is we're very careful to not eat foods which might end up being uh, become chametz. So certainly raw wheat, you know, don't eat oatmeal and stuff like that or raw wheat because it might accidentally become chametz. Now rice typically doesn't do that, but there is something called rice flour. So there's a danger, or at least a concern that people might think there's a possibility if you eat rice, it might become flour. So Ashkenazi Jews, 
are strict and won't eat rice. And Sephardic Jews uh, just say, be, just be careful. Check your rice to make sure no wheat got mixed in. Make sure you don't, you know, make, whatever you do with it, just be extra careful. So the question is, because an Ashkenazi Jew, who the universally accepted custom is Ashkenazi don't eat rice, could they eat rice? It's clearly not against the Torah. There's no legal precedent for it. It's a custom, an extra custom to make sure that one doesn't accidentally eat any chametz. So that's the question we're going to answer tonight. And I will take a step back. Um, and one of the big things I sort of glossed over is all of these different traditions um, come from where Jews lived, sometimes down to the very town, or the very shul, or the very rabbi they followed. But the two biggest, most well-known traditions are known as Ashkenaz and uh, Sephardi Jews. So Ashkenaz and Sfarad, these were names of places that existed in the Tanakh. However, they were co-opted um, as a way to identify and, I guess, Jewify the lands in which Jews were living in exile to sort of connect their local places to classical lands. Now, you may have some Jews say, no, the, the place Ashkenaz of the Torah is the Ashkenaz of basically what was Saxony or modern day, more or less Germany, borders constantly change. There's very little evidence for that. But regardless, when Jews say they're Ashkenazim, they have some sort of historical connection to the German Eastern European lands. The reality is, I don't know if most, but probably most Ashkenazi Jews are more connected to Russian um, sorry, that's Western European would be Germany. Most Ashkenazi Jews are connected more to Eastern European, Poland, and Russia, which is not the same as Ashkenaz. So it's kind of become a catch-all term for everybody who's not Sephardic. So the truth is, again, back in the day, my custom would have been, I'm from the town of Mainz or Worms or something. Oh, Worms is an acronym for all of them. I'm from the town of Mainz. That's my tradition. This is my shul. But today, Ashkenazim kind of captures a huge, all- Eastern and mostly Western European Jews. Sephardim from the word Sfarad uh, became associated with Spain or more or less the Iberian Peninsula. And that again has sort of sucked up Middle Eastern Jews, Iranian Jews, et cetera, but that's not. There used to be a distinction, Yemenite Jews, uh, all the Middle Eastern countries, Iraqi Jews, Baghdadi Jews from Baghdad. They all had their own different traditions. Today, they've all kind of been swallowed together. But regardless of that, the question is, could I wake up tomorrow and say, you know what? I like being a Baghdadi Jew. I'm done with my Ashkenazi, Eastern European, Russian uh, uh, sitter. I want to do a Baghdadi Sidur and follow their, uh, follow the way their Sidur is laid out. Can I just do that? Or again, the other question, can I take on any other custom, including eating right on Pes rice on Pesach? So we're going to look at two main sources. The first one is from a rabbi we've seen before, Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, who again is a rabbi in Israel. He's a Rosh Hashiva, very, very active, writing this series of books, Peninei Halakha, um, on contemporary Jewish, or really just a, a whole compilation of all Jewish law, responding to contemporary issues. Brilliant rabbi. And he's, we're going to start with a very specific question, which is changing the way one prays, the layout of the Sidur the way one pronounces their Sidur, even picking their synagogue, saying, I don't want to be of the European tradition. I like the, the, the Middle Eastern tradition. I want to pray like a Yemenite Jew. I want to pray like a Moroccan Jew. Can one just do that? And the answer to there, the final answer will be different than the answer to the one about rice, but many of the principles and the underlying questions that should be asked in this process are included in this answer. So before we go into it, and then the last source will be an essay that looks more globally at changing customs in general and what loyalty we have to a custom. It's just a custom, right? So before we start that first source, are there any questions up until now? Excellent. So Jane, you're actually unmuted, Jane. So I will have you take this first source. And this is from Rabbi Malamed's book, and it's available, the whole thing online, Hebrew and English. Um, this is his book on tefillah. Um, and again, he just, he, it's really nice. He kind of jumps into a little bit of an overview um, of a lot of what I said, and then he gets right into the question. So please, Jane. In the past, when the distance between communities was great, Ashkenazim lived in Ashkenaz, Sephardim in Spain, and Yemenites in Yemen. Any person who moved to another place would adopt the minhag of his new place and practice the customs of the local Jews regarding halacha and prayer. Before you go on, because we're going to come back to that. That's a huge principle. Um, so Jane, what defines your custom? Rome. Yeah, yeah so. where you lived, 100%. So much so that if I moved to Baghdad, which is probably not a good idea right now, but if I moved there, 
uh, and I joined the Baghdadi community. I keep saying Baghdad because one of my good friends is a rabbi of a Baghdadi shul. I would adopt their custom. Now we're going to come back to today, people saying, well, A, there's no Jews in Baghdad, and B, even if you went there, they might be Ashkenazim or they might be Yemenites. Like there's no such thing as Baghdadi Jewish community. Everything's a big mishmash. So we'll come back to that. But classically, if you doesn't matter what your custom is, if you move to a new place where it has one communal custom, just take it on. So hypothetically, the simple answer to my question is, if I moved to a community where they all ate rice on Pesach and all my neighbors did that, could I eat rice on Pesach so far? Answer seems to be, yeah. And that's more or less the answer. Again, today it's complicated, but please continue, Jane. Even if over the course of time, many people migrate to a community and become the majority there, as long as they arrive as individuals, they are outweighed by the community in which they settle and must practice according to the custom of the new place. So there's no law of attrition here. Even if a, a, you know, a community of 10,000 uh, Sephardic Jews and eventually a million Ashkenazi move there, but they do it over 50 years, all those Ashkenazim are going to morph into Sephardim as they move one, two, three, four at a time. Um, so the power of the place is almost more, and the communal minhag is more important than majority rules. Again, there's a little difference if a million all move at once, but if a million move at once, they'll probably just start their own city at that point. Please continue. That's not what happened in American history. American history is much, much more complicated, and, and it will be touched on in the last source when Rav Moshe okay. Feinstein speaks up, but you are right, Jane. That's a big, not a bad thing. It's a very complicated uh, uh, issue here. Yeah, please. The law is similar regarding a woman who married a man from a different ethnic group. She is considered someone who migrated from her community to his. She must abide by his practices, whether they are more strict or lenient, and she need not perform a hatarat nidarim, an annulment of vows. So pause there, because again, two important principles. Now, are there communities where this isn't as strictly practiced? I don't know. But the classical thing is that if a Sephardic woman married an Ashkenazi man, who takes precedence, it's always the man. So she would take on Ashkenazi and vice versa. If she was Ashkenazi and he was Sephardi, she would take it on. Is there more leniency today for her to keep some of her customs, um, for them to have a dual house? Probably, I know that there are cases, um, but that may not be the best thing. It's often good for them to have one unified minhag. However, to say that the man always wins, um, that I think is an ongoing question today, but classically, um, a woman who entered a household or a family, she got married, she would follow by the husband. But the second thing here, so that's another major principle. But the last thing that um, Jane just read, and it, he quotes Rav Moshe here, but others say it is, um, if I accept upon myself, let's say a new law, I am going to forbid myself, I'm going to vow before God that I'm going to do something or not do something. The Torah tells us, try not to do it, but if you do it, it's binding. But what if I make a mistake? I swear off candy in a moment of, of, of passion and insanity. And I realized that was a mistake because then I love candy. Um, depending on the situation, I can go to a court of three rabbis and say, I was an idiot. I was, I was drunk on not having candy, whatever it is like that. Can you annul my vow? Can you make it as if I never made that oath? And if I have a good reason and I can convince them that I made a mistake in my thinking, they can annul it and then I can walk away. But Unless I get a Hatarat Nedarim, which is something we do before Rosh Hashanah, any uh, uh, promises I made to God over the last year that were stupid, I never should have made them, God, or we say it in front of three observant male Jews, please let me out of it. As long as they were made as a mistake and I wouldn't have made them if I was in my right man, they disappear. But here it's saying custom, in certain cases, you don't need to do that. Even though you've been doing a custom your whole life, this woman has been eating rice on Pesach her entire life. Like there's nothing stronger than that. It's stronger than a law. When she go, if you go to a new community or she gets married, disappears. So custom is unbelievably strong, but it still bows and disappears in the face of certain realities, which again, uh, the community or the family can be much more important than even a longstanding custom. Uh, go ahead, Jane, please. When an entire community migrates to another place, since it is its own entity, it does not need to conform to the customs of the people there. Even if the original people are the majority, as long as the new ones are united as an independent community, they should continue their initial minhagim. Excellent. So Jane, you had made a comment about America. So how does this square with what happened in America, which you know the history far better than I? Well, like in New York, when the Ashkenazim came and they didn't want to be part of the Sephardic synagogue, they just made their own, but it's not like they didn't try. It's, it's yeah. they, 
And that was true, I think, in Charleston and Savannah and those places too. They looked and didn't like what they saw, so eventually they made their own. So had they had a book that was published well over 100 years later, they would have seen that that was appropriate in the, the practice. And the, the Sephardic Jews you're mentioning, those are Spanish Portuguese, yeah? Right. Which are like real well, Spanish I mean, Sephardic. Um, yeah. But yes, so that is a common thing that happens. But what we've learned here is what we so far we haven't seen like every detail we need to answer our question. Um, but we see that if you go to a new place and there's a clear communal minhad there, it over it overwhelms it. But we haven't seen the question of can I just willy nilly? I don't say willy nilly, but can I just change a custom if I don't move to a new community? So we've seen things where you can do it, which is again you move to a new community, um, and we've seen exceptions to that if I move with my community to a new geographic location, then we can take our custom uh, with us. And it goes back to a much more underlying philosophical question about what the purpose of custom is. Custom in Minhag isn't just about how do I shake my lulav, it's also going back to what I started with, identity. It's about a way to allow a community to cohere. And the question is which values are more important, my personal practice or having a community which is unified. And he's gonna actually mention a few of those um, principles based on verses in the Torah. And there's one that doesn't come up here, um, but there's a line the rabbis talk about, do not separate, uh, do not separate from your community. Uh, which means like if I go to a synagogue uh, and there's one thing about whether people who wear tefillin wear it on Cholomoed, the days between, you know, of su between Sukkot and Pesach. Some put on tefillin, some say it's a holiday and they don't put on tefillin. But if I go to a shore, everyone does it, should I not do it? Or if or no one does it, should I do it? And often what they say is if nobody does it, I should do it in private because I don't want to separate myself from the community. So the value of a unified community often trumps personal practice. But of course, there are exceptions to that. So Elizabeth, are any questions up until now? We're going to the second source. Excellent. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And the second source, um, and this is just a funny little thing. The first source here was from his chapter six, section four. Um, and then the next one is chapter six, section three. So in the English, this next paragraph comes first but you'll see that it makes a lot more sense to come afterwards. And in fact, in the Hebrew version, the order is switched. So the Hebrew, and when he's in Hebrew, he had more of a sense of order and everything like that. But in the English, he got all turned around. So even though this in the English version comes first, it makes a lot more sense for it to come later. Or there was a printing error, I don't know. Um, but Elizabeth, go ahead. Now he's going to get on to a much more specific question about um, changing minhads, specifically with prayer um, and synagogue. So. Elizabeth, please. As we have learned, one must ma maintain his family's minhag. The Hachamim based this statement on the verse, Altis tot torat imecha, meaning, do not abandon your mother's teachings. However, this custom is no more important than other laws, and therefore it is often superseded. For example, when a person knows for certain that he will have less kavanah praying. Pause there for a moment. So for those who were in the, the class a few weeks ago on the prayer and saying the Shema, the word kavanah connected to the word for direction or focus, but basically being able to, you know, when I'm praying, be able to focus on what I'm praying about. So if I go to a synagogue and their manner of prayer makes it so I can't, I can't follow along, I can't pay attention, it's too raucous for me. I'll give you an example, Spanish Portuguese. If you don't, if you haven't gone to a Spanish Portuguese synagogue, go to one, they're gorgeous, but they're very decorous, they're very formal. And some people love that, that sense of order. And if you go to other synagogues, it's wild and crazy and everybody's jumping up and stuff like that. Each of those are appropriate and beautiful. And here's the thing, both of them are praying. Both of them say Shema and Amidah and read from the same Torah, but the difference is the, the way they pronounce the language, sometimes the orders of the prayer, the manner in which they pray, all of those things can be different. They're still fulfilling the core mitzvah, the core obligations, but how they do it is influenced by their culture, their geography, their language, and so many other factors. But what if I'm in a synagogue? What if my sidur doesn't work for me? What if it just won't allow me to connect to God? So go ahead, sorry, please continue, Elizabeth, so that he will have less kavana praying. In a synagogue that conducts services in his family's nusach. And nusach is the, um, the version of the text that there is, again, literally the, the way the text is laid out on the page, the order of prayers, um, but also the way they're, they're um, uh, pronounced. You know, we have Ashkenazim where the letter taf becomes a suh, um, which we don't do at Lake Park Synagogue. 
And my custom I got from my father who got it from being an Israeli, but I guarantee my great grandfather who I'm named after, uh, named after uh, would not have daven that way. And that actually did come up in some of the sources about the fact that like, I don't follow directly um, from my great grandparents, but I do follow my father. So how does that work in America? But um, that's what Nusach means, just like the version and way the prayers are said, et cetera. So please continue. Uh, the family's Nusach then in a synagogue in which the services are conducted in a different Nusach. He should choose the one in which he can concentrate better. The Kavanah is the essence of prayer. However, in a case of uncertainty, it is preferable to pray in his family's Nusach because in the long term, chances are that he will have more Kavanah praying as his family does. Sometimes when a person is young, he does not properly value his connection to his family's Nusach. Though as time passes, he discovers a deep attachment to it. Pause there for a moment um, before the ellipses. So he lays down a few very important principles. Again, let's go back to the example of shaking the, you know, the lulav um, on Sukkot. If I shake it three times in each direction versus two times, now there may be deep significance there, but ultimately it's not going to fundamentally change my experience. So few rabbis are going to say, oh, I want to do three now. A lot of rabbis are going to say, what's your family tradition? Well, it's been three for a thousand years or been two for a thousand years. Many rabbis would say, don't change it. But if I go to them and say, I can't pray to God, I cannot connect to God with the way that I'm davening now, then the rabbis may say, you don't even need to go to a court of three rabbis and get a vow annulled because what's the essence here? The customs are there to help us fulfill the mitzvot and to connect to God and to connect to prayer. If they are getting in the way of doing that, then they're missing the whole point. And then there's a lot more room, particularly in prayer, um, to change our customs. Because again, the whole thing there is the commandment is to pray. If your custom is getting in the way of that, then maybe the custom should be changed, not can be, but should be changed. However, if someone is like, oh, Sephardim are cooler. I mean, I'm fine Ashkenaz, I can pay attention here. I'm a teenager, so I can't pay attention to anything, but I don't have a good reason for changing then they might get discouraged from rabbis. But there are absolutely people who have grown up in a shul and they realize they just can't connect with the way that services are done there. And as he, and based on others before him, that's an area where we could change a custom. But when custom becomes more difficult to change is when there's not necessarily a good reason to change it. We'll come back to that. If there's a good reason to change a custom, it's fairly easy to change it. If there's not a really good compelling reason, then it's tougher to change it. I'm oversimplifying, but not by much. So when it comes to praying to God, if my custom doesn't allow me to do it well, the Siddur doesn't allow me to connect to God, you can bet custom is trumped and is a much lower value than connecting to God. But if it's a matter of, oh, it's, you know, I, I don't love it, but I can do it, then maybe that's not as strong because they're all, it's all about balancing values. And, he's, and he editorializes a lot. He's saying, look, you, why don't you spend a little bit more time, learn more about your tradition beside, before you decide to throw it out the window. Um, so that's what he says about prayer. Now he talks about changing synagogues. That classic joke on a guy on an island builds two synagogues. The one is the one he goes to. And why do you build a second one? You're the only one there. So I have the one that I don't go to. you will have that. So go ahead, Elizabeth, after the ellipses, if a person must choose. If a person must choose between two synagogues, one where the congregation prays in his family's Nusach, but he is concerned that he will not be able to connect with the people because they're either too old, too young, or too few in number. And another, where they do pray in his family's Nusach. Or they do but, not pray in his family's Nusach. Sorry, do not no, that's pray. that's okay. But there is a unified congregation with which he can better identify. If he feels that by joining the prayers of the latter synagogue, his connection to the Jewish religious community will intensify thereby enhancing or at least sustaining his spiritual level. It is preferable that he prays there, even though the prayers are not of his family's nusa. Thank you. This is huge, Rabbi Malama. This is incredible. So the idea that the value of connecting to God and fulfilling the mitzvah prayer properly is more important than exactly how I pronounce the words in the order of the siddur, that's secondary. That he establishes, and it's legally there's a legal precedent for that. And again, I don't need to go to rabbis to ask permission. I can pray in the way that connects me to God. But here, what he says is so powerful is that at the end of the day, it's not even just about me connecting to God. What's another major value that would allow me to change um, the way I pray is having a shul where I feel a sense of community, community and identity. Wow, 
Like he said, like you don't have rabbis that always are so explicit. A lot of the teshuvo kind of couch it in, in other terms and other legalistic things. And here, and again, he's basing this off of our long tradition. There's a lot of precedent for this. He's not the only one who said all this, but that's a big deal that he says that, is that identity and connecting to a community are high values. And the reason that's important is the purpose, one of the main purposes of minhag is to create community and to create a, a sense of cohesion and identity to allow us to do Judaism together. The Torah was not given um, to a person alone on a mountain. It was given to a whole people unified together. But when it lacks that, custom needs to change. And while there's certainly room for law in certain cases to change, all the more so there should be custom. However, because custom's very purpose is to keep community together, it's often harder to change, particularly in a case of a family where a father or a mother, what did that, the verse from Proverbs from Mishle say, don't turn away, do not leave the tradition of your mother, saying to children, how dare you choose a, a different Sidor? Our family has been praying this way for 500 years. You're breaking your mother and your bubby's heart. That means something that's very powerful, but there are other values where that becomes secondary. Now, the example that we just see here, one probably comes up a lot. And there are probably people in our synagogue who have a siddur that they've been using for 40, 50 years. And for the rabbi to suggest that we would ever buy a new machzor, he's crazy, he's out of his mind. But I respect that. Why? Because the power of tradition connects us to something greater than ourselves. And by being connected strongly to a community, ideally allows us to connect to God. It's all meant to bring this sense of unity. But when it fails to do that, then there's room for change. And particularly in the area of prayer, um, there's a lot more leniency and you don't need to go through this formal process. But now that we've looked at something that's very, very common and relatively easy to change, if there's a good reason, if there's a good reason, but you don't have to convince anyone except for yourself. He does say that one should talk to the rabbi about it and that's fine and I respect that. And you should too, you can too, but ultimately it's a personal decision about what Sidor one wants to choose, how they want to pronounce the Hebrew words, and certainly what synagogue one wants to go to, particularly in America and really almost every country now. But what about other customs that are very, very ancient, but they don't necessarily get in the way of our ability to connect to God? They might be annoying, but they're not really about a fundamental, um, uh, about how we fulfill a mitzvah. Again, rice. The thing about not eating rice is how to do Pesach better but ultimately, whether we eat rice or not, it's not about the underlying mitzvah. It's a fence around the Torah for Ashkenazim to be extra careful so they don't even, nobody even thinks they're eating chametz. So what about those or how we shake the lulav, things that may not fundamentally affect our connection to, to God, but, and this is key, they may not affect how we do the mitzvah and connect to God, but they do affect how we connect to our community. We've already seen one answer to that that'll come up again is if we go to a brand new community where everyone is doing it, differently than we were raised, then it is appropriate to change because the goal is to connect to the community. But what about if I live in Milwaukee in Shorewood where yes, our, our synagogue identifies as Ashkenazi, but again, the idea of that identity, that group identity is not as strong as it used to be. And particularly with the rise of Hasidic Judaism where they're very influenced, their Sidur by Sephardic customs in their actual text. The line between Ashkenazi and Sephardi is much more blurred. So should we have more flexibility with our customs? So before we go on to the final source, any questions up until now? Beautiful. Um, let's see, Lynn, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. So this last article, I, it's from a, a longer article, which I encourage you to, to check out. There's a website, it's a blog actually, Torah Musings um, from this Rabbi Gill student. He's published a number of books and he is, I, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, he has this great sense of humor. He's very down to earth. Not that he's always going to be lenient per se. He often has more of a mainstream modern orthodox or centrist, whatever you want to identify. But he's someone who has a great deal of intellectual honesty and thoroughness. Not that everything he says is perfect. I, I mean, I haven't known him to make a mistake, but um, he has a brilliant style that's very accessible. And he has a lot of fun topics too. If there's something like no one's written about this, Rabbi Gil student probably has. Uh, and again, he's a contemporary uh, rabbi in the States, and you can read more about him, but Torah Musings is his blog, and you could probably get lost uh, reading all the fun stuff he has. Uh, and I took out some of his sources, but he uh, always brings all of his sources 
well footnoted. He has a high level of academic integrity as well. And in this article, the longer version of it, one of the first things he does is he talks about why minhagim, these customs develop in the first place in the different kinds. So I don't think we need to go through all of those here, but for example, there's a difference between a custom about simply how to do something or a custom that someone takes on because they want to be extra pious. You know, they, there's a fast that's 25 hours. They say, I, my custom is to do 26 hours because, you know, I want to be extra pious and closer to God. That's not legally binding. There's no reason to do it. It's not going to help you do the mitzvah any better. It's, uh, and it's not like uh, what's a, um, a fence around the Torah. For example, well, we keep our dishes totally separate. I have two sets of dishes. Technically, we don't necessarily need to. There's a way to use the same dish for meat and dairy. Uh, you know, if you keep a cold, it's always to do it. But the custom is, the custom is to make sure we don't make mistakes in the kitchen to have two, set, two sets of dishes. So there's all kinds of different reasons a custom will come up. And based on why a custom comes up, that also influence, influences how we can change it. And he also talks about customs that are just a mistake. Somebody misunderstood a text and started doing something wrong for a thousand years. And then they said, ooh, I, I, missed, uh, I missed this letter here and we we're wrong. Um, and he also talks about that. But Lynn, go ahead. And he gets into first a little general statement about customs. And then he starts getting into the central story from the Talmud upon which everybody discusses whether or not we can change custom. That one story, all conversations go from there based on that one story. So go ahead, please, Lynn. Generally speaking, a minhag is a type of neder, an explicit or implicit vow to observe a practice. Some nedarim are subject to annulment through hatarat nedarim, a fairly common practice. When can we do hatarat nedarim on a minhag we no longer wish to observe? When can we stop observing it even without hatarat nedarim? So a great example, we don't do it today, but an example of a neder in the Torah is to become a nazir to swear off um, wine, et cetera, like that. Now in the Torah, they had a whole sacrifice to come out of it, um, which replaced Hatanat Nedarim. But if somebody says, I'm never gonna have uh, wine ever again, and they swear before God, um, if they really meant it, they can't just stop doing it one day. It is binding and they have to go through a formal process. And by the way, just going to three rabbis and saying, I changed my mind um, is not necessarily enough. They have to convince the rabbis that they were mistaken and they didn't realize what they were doing and it was a dumb mistake and then the rabbis can help them out of it. But sometimes customs, as we'll see here, are binding forever. But the other example, um, just to tell you know, quiz from what we talked about five minutes ago, what's an example of changing a practice where we don't need to go through the formal practice? Is changing the way we? We just read it in the source right above. Changing the way we? Pray. Right. Exactly, changing the way we pray. That's an example of a, uh, a min, or not a neder, but a minhag where we don't need to go through the formal process. So now he's going to summarize the famous story about changing practices. And again, pay attention to why this family, this B'nai Beishan or the city, we're not quite sure why they did this practice in the first place. Please, Lynn. The Babylonian Talmud in Psachim 50b tells the story of B'nai Beishan, who had the minhag of refraining from going to the marketplace on Friday in order to ensure proper preparation for Shabbat and avoid any potential Shabbat violations. They wished to annul this minhag that they had inherited. Rabbi Yochanan told them that they could not because Proverbs 1.8 says, listen, son, to the rebuke of your father and do not abandon the teaching of your mother. The Talmud Yerushalmi Psachim 4.1 says that if people observe a minhag because they thought it was the actual law, then if they ask you, can permit it. Then if they it, ask, probably comma. Then if they ask, you can permit it for them. If they knew it was not required by the technical law and still observed it for an extra measure, then even if they ask, you cannot permit it for them. Excellent. So it's unpacked. So one nice thing here is remember Penine Halacha, he brought in that verse from Mishle about why the rabbi said we don't change customs, certainly not easily. And this is where it's from. It's from this source in the Talmud. This is where they quoted that verse and later rabbis, um, you know, based on that. But again, these people, B'nai B'Shan, which it's unclear if it's a family or a town, but their custom is on Friday is don't like some people do all their Shabbos shopping on Friday morning. One person who does that, but they didn't do it. They did it on Thursday to make sure that they wouldn't accidentally be running late and they wouldn't accidentally break Shabbat if they couldn't get back from the market in time. 
There's no legal need for that. And, you know, it's, it's they're being extra strict, extra pious, extra careful, but they chose to do that minhag out of piety. Now, again, they didn't think it was because of a legal reason. They didn't think it was the way to fulfill. There's no mitzvah that they were fulfilling. They were protecting a practice. However, they adopted that minhag and it made perfect sense to them at the time. So when they went to Rabbi Yochanan, he said, no. Now, the Yerushalmi that um, Rabbi Student brings here says that if people started a custom because they thought it was the law, let's say they had accidentally misunderstood that it's against Jewish law, it's forbidden by the Shulchan Aruch, oh, this text is from thousands of years before that, it's forbidden by Jewish law to go shopping for Shabbat on Friday. They misunderstood something. And they, he said, why don't, you, why don't you go to the market on Friday? Because it's forbidden. It's, it's forbidden from the Torah. No, it's not. That's your custom. It is? We didn't realize it was a custom. Then you can get out of it. But if they knew what they were doing, and that's so key, if someone knows what they're doing when they get into a custom, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to just undo that custom. And I, in the back of your head, some of you might be thinking, well, when I was born, I didn't know what I was doing becoming an Ashkenazi Jew. I didn't decide to not eat rice on Pesach. The rabbis do discuss that. Um, but that's the basic principle there is if a community or a family adopts a, cost, a custom and they know it's a custom, then there's not a lot of room to undo it unless they accepted it mistakenly and thought that the custom was law. Any questions up until then? Great. Lynn, I'll have you take a little more and then I'll take it to the end. So I'll have you take this next paragraph. So it's going to mention a lot of different rabbis. Actually, the Rosh they're going to mention, Rabbeinu Asher, was a rabbi who uh, was from Ashkenaz and then moved to Sephardic lands and had a lot of influence both on his personal practice and on the development of Jewish law. And he's the grandfather of um, uh, the, the one who wrote Arba Turim, upon which the Shulchan Aruch is uh, written. So he's one of the big three Ashkenazi rabbis uh, who really helped form what we know as Jewish law today with his direct legal commentaries on the Talmud. So when you say the Rosh, it's a big deal. So go ahead, Lynn, please. According to the Rosh, B'nai Beishan could have asked for their minhag to be annulled with Hatarat Nidarim. Rabbi Yochanan merely told them that as things stood at the time, they were bound by the minhag, but they could have gotten out of it with Hatarat Nidarim. So that's an interesting point there, is maybe they said, oh, is, this, is it just, can we just stop doing this custom? And he said, no, you can't just stop doing it, but you can go through this whole formal process. However, saying they could get out of it by Hatarat Nedarim also implies that they have to convince the rabbis that their custom was mistaken in the first place. So the Rosher, basically this whole, there were like three paragraphs I took out where all the rabbis argue back and forth. What really happened? Why did Rabbi Yochanan say no? And why did they think that they could just undo um, their custom? But the reason I brought this uh, final statement here by the Rosh is, um, you know, you can do, uh, oh, you were going to do a little bit more anyways, Lynn, is where he continues on significantly, please. Significantly, the Shulchan Aruch, Yoridea 214.1, follows the Rosh, as do all subsequent standard authorities. Rav Shlomo Luria, response on Maharshal, number six, adds that a custom can only be annulled by someone not bound by it. Therefore, a custom universally practiced by Jews cannot be removed. Keep going. Well, well, that's interesting. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. The Shach Yoridea 214.4 follows this ruling, as does the Prichadash, Ibn in paragraph six, who says that this is clear. Therefore, universal Jewish customs can never be annulled. That's why I had you go to the end, because it was just saying that everyone agrees to that. So if I want to annul an Ashkenazi practice, so let's say that I did want to become a Sephardic Jew which we still haven't answered whether that's possible, but let's say it was. Let's say I could go to a beit in a court of three rabbis or three observant Jewish men and do hatarat nedarim and know my vows and become Sephardic. I couldn't do it with Ashkenazi Jews. I would have to go to a Sephardic beit din because I can't go to a Jew who also doesn't eat rice on Pesach or a beit din of them and say, stop this custom for me. Now, a question is, what is a universal Jewish custom? The things I'm thinking of, I don't know. I, I would say something like separate dishes, but I don't know if that's considered. You, but let's say that is a universal. Oh, no, I do know a universal Jewish custom, not eating chicken and dairy. Strictly speaking, um, dairy, uh, you know, uh, chicken and our poultry and milk are not technically the same as meat and dairy. However, at this point, it has been beyond, beyond accepted. And the reason I know it's a custom in the Talmud, it says there was a town where people ate chicken and dairy. 
And the rabbi said, that's fine for that town, but no one else can do it. So we know that it's a custom, but boy, howdy, it is as universal as can be that you cannot have chicken parm, even if both the, the cheese and the, the chicken are um, kosher. That's a universal custom. There's no way to get out of that whatsoever. So to even begin this conversation, our final, our, our big question about changing from rice um, uh, for, to be able to, for Ashkenazi to eat rice on Pesach, there's maybe a possibility there. I can go to a Sephardic rabbi, but there are some customs, whether family or communal, that can just never, ever be removed under any circumstances. They've been universally accepted. To overrule them would be, I mean, again, realistically, the, I, most Jews probably don't keep kosher anyways, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about within Jews who identify as those who choose to be observant and choose to abide by the practice of minhagim. I'm double using that word. Um, but within that world, those who play by those rules, um, there are certain customs that are never going to change, like chicken and dairy. And by the way, Sephardic Jews will not have fish and dairy. So I would never want to, I would never give up my tuna melts. Um, but that, that's another thing there. And that's not a universal custom. So could a Sephardic Jew to go to, to me and to other rabbis and say, I want to have a tuna melt. And had I known about this when I was born, I would have said, absolutely not. So now I will go ahead and take us to the last section. So he brings another, a couple of other relevant issues here. I mentioned one before, mistaken practices. All agree, I said this, that a practice adopted due to a mistaken understanding is not binding. For example, if you thought a specific food is forbidden and therefore refrain from eating it and later discover that there is no basis to consider the food forbidden, you may freely eat that food. The minhag is not binding. You do not even need to do hataret nedarim. Now, I, I, I feel like I know a few examples of things that like in the certain Orthodox worlds, they take for granted that you do a custom, but it became clear that that was based on a mistake and there's no reason to, I can't think of any right now, but hypothetically, there are certain practices that we might do um, where we find out that they were a mistake to begin with and hypothetically, we can drop it. And the thing is, we don't need a great rabbinic court. We don't need the Sanhedrin. We don't need the, the, the Rabbanut of Israel to come and lay down a law that you can do it. If we find that a midhag is based on a mistaken understanding of something, we should throw it out. But again, the reality is custom is so strong that even if you convince people or show them proof that they're wrong, they'll still probably do it um, anyways. So that's, again, it's, about, it's more about identity and community than it is about the technical um, requirement of the laws and how law develops. So the fourth section, received customs. And then this is one that some of you might have been wondering about, uh, about family versus community. You know, we haven't really talked about personal customs where I choose it myself. And if I made a mistake, I can overrule it. I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. I was born into it. So the ruling about annulling customs we have discussed so far generally referred to the people who initially adopted the customs, meaning, you know, if the Lake Park Synagogue decides to have a custom, and then we realize, if, it, if we realize we made a mistake, we just throw it out the window. If we realize after two years it was a, it was a mistake, um, it depends on what we did and how we did it. We may have to go to other rabbinic authorities to help overrule it or something like, again, it depends on how it was done. Most minhagim we observe today are received from previous generations. The thing about fish and chicken and dairy and rice and everything like that, we've been doing that for hundreds, if not uh, thousands of years. So who or what is Beishan? Beishan is a contraction of Beit She'an, a city in Israel that still exists. There's some argument about that, but this is kind of the accepted version of it. The people of that city, the members of Beit She'an, approached Rabbi Yochanan about discarding a local custom. As long as you associate with that place, you must follow its custom. So a group of people from Beit She'an said, we don't like the Beit She'an customs. So this actually disagrees with some of the earlier, earlier things that we've seen, like the Rosh, which is um, Rabbi Yochanan would never have let them get out of it because it's the custom of that place. And the custom of the place, minhag hamakom, the custom of the place is minhag. As long as you associate with that place, you must follow the customs, its custom. The Mishnah states that someone who comes from a place with a specific custom must observe it even if he is spending time elsewhere. Ah, this sounds different though. Now I'm bringing a custom from out of town? The Gemara adds that if you move to a place, you become a member of that city and adopt its customs. So the Mishnah said, bring your customs with you. But if you move to that place and live there, then you adopt their customs. Therefore, if you live in a city with a custom you wish to discard, you can move to a city with a contrary custom. So at the end of the day, the final ruling, the final ruling is you adopt the customs of the place that you live in. And if you don't like it, get out of town. 
That's really your, your only option. Again, if it's a personal custom that you made as a mistake, there's ways to get out of it. With prayer, there are ways to change it. But a fundamental custom of the city of Baghdad, the city of, of, of Krakow, you got to stick with it as long as you live there. However, this only works if the new place has a custom that contradicts the custom of the old place. The new custom overrides the old one. So if I move from Krakow to, um, to trying to think of other places here, to just somewhere else in Poland, um, to Auschwitz or something like that, and they have the same custom, I can't change it. So I move from one custom, you know, out of the frying pan and into the frying pan. Nothing changes. If you move to a city that has no standard custom, this is going to get more relevant for us today in America, in which many people with different customs coexist within one community, then there is no new custom to override the old custom. So what do you do? You got to keep your old one. So when Jews came to uh, the States, uh, regardless of any tensions between the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews, if they were saying, you know, for let's say a Jew comes to America today and they move to Milwaukee, where there's a lot of different synagogues, even though they're more or less all Ashkenazim, um, they say, which one do I do? Hasidic? Do I do uh, Litvak? Do I do Mignadim? Do I do modern Orthodox? Whatever it is like that. I, if there's no one clear reigning custom, you adopt, you keep the custom that you came with. And again, that's very important and very relevant for Israel. So you have all of these immigrant communities coming in. Now, if they come as a community, they keep that identity. We have individual customs and people coming from Russia or from France or everything like that. And if they come in and they move to a town where everybody's a little bit different, they don't get to just pick and choose. One can't just throw out a minhag and say, oh, I like that one more. Unless there is an overwhelming communal identifying custom, you stick with the one that you were born with. Rav Moshe Feinstein, and now that he talks about America, uh, writes that there's no such thing as a local custom in America. It doesn't matter where you go. There's no such thing as I'm following the custom of Milwaukee. Everyone who moves to America must keep their prior customs. And again, even though he was later than those Jews who moved to America, Jane, this is probably influenced by that kind of journey and that experience of Jews who continue to move to America from other countries. Uh, Rob Herschel Schachter, who's a contemporary rabbi writing today, um, explains that some customs are family-based and some locale-based, although they're not always easy to differentiate. That's why I said before, what's the difference between my family and my community? It's not always clear. You must follow a family custom, even if you move to a place that has a different custom. So if I'm Baghdadi and I move to, um, to, to Kuwait or something like that, and I enter a new community, I start that new one. But if I have an individual separate family custom that doesn't contradict where I move to, I got to keep it with me. If my family's custom is at the Pesach Seder, we always do one special line from the book of Proverbs, Mishle, before the second cup. And that is family custom. That stays no matter what. That is going to continue, and I can't. And if other custom, if communities just happen to not say it, that's not strong enough to get rid of it. But if I move to a community where everyone does say a line before it, and they say a different line, then the community may override it. He adds that if you change families, you change family customs. So there is an exception to all of these things. One example is a woman who marries, <clears throat> and generally speaking, adopts the customs of her husband's family. And again, there's exceptions to all this. I've been doing Pesach Seder mostly with Sarah's family. So you can bet that I'm going to follow their family customs, which again, they're very minor. And I don't know if you would identify them as customs so much as fun songs and melodies, et cetera, like that. But that's an example of where this would apply, where the way I did it growing up is shifting to adjust, adopt, and become closer to my family. The fact that when I do something, I make sure it's the, mamily, the, the melody that Sarah's grandfather did is so powerful for Sarah. And that is a moment of connection for us. And that makes everything more powerful. I don't just say, well, my grandfather did it this way. I don't care what you think. That's not the point of custom. It's not what custom is here to do. It's to unify us. Adopts the customs of her husband's family. We see not always. However, sometimes a man with little knowledge of his lineage, for example, a Baal Teshuvah marries a woman of prominent lineage and adopts her family's customs. So this becomes really my own personal experience where I grew up not fully observant and I became fully observant and I didn't necessarily have, you know, customs for everything. And I even asked my father, Oliva Shalom, I said, what do we do in this case? And he said, I don't know. He had, you know, he hadn't forgotten his grandfather, maybe they didn't know. So what I did is I turned to the general community in which I was at the time and that became my custom. So the reality is customs are a lot more stickier and complicated 
than is even presented here, which is why it's important that they're not changed so easily. It's important that even though I adopted certain customs, it allowed me to connect to something much greater than myself. And everywhere I go, for example, how long one waits between meat and dairy, where I grew up keeping only a few hours. And when I became Orthodox, I kept six. Every Orthodox Jew I meet keeps six hours. There are exceptions, of course, German Jews, et cetera, like that. But for the most part, it puts me in line with the overall global community of uh, uh, Orthodox Jews that I keep six hours. And that's important. It's important that I don't play around with that and say, oh, I'm going to do three because you know that, that's easier for me or I like that more. Technically, it's not forbidden, but it's going to create a, a boundary between me and other Orthodox Jews. So now he summarizes, when can you change a custom? One, if it falls in a category of a mistaken custom, again, there are examples of that I can't think of any off the top of my head, but if a community is doing something, it turns out they're wrong and they shouldn't be doing it, they just throw it out with no effort whatsoever, bye-bye, just make sure they're right about it. And he does talk about if there's a rabbi who's convinced that someone misread an earlier rabbi, they better be sure. But if they're sure and they have great evidence for it, they just throw out the custom. Two, it is based on a prior halachic or legal ruling and one of the unique Torah scholars of the generation ruled against this practice. So that's, that's what I was talking about here is, you know, you have a, a, a rabbi who ruled against a clear principle and you can uh, convince people or prove that rabbi was wrong, then you can just throw it out. Um, so that can get very political, um, but there's room for that. Three, all or most of the people <coughs> subject to the custom formally annul it which is not possible with a universal custom. This is a great question when it comes to hummus and um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews who don't eat legumes and chickpeas and stuff like that on Pesach. What if all Ashkenazi Jews just start eating hummus on Pesach? It's not a universal, I, I don't know if you would define it as universal because it's only Ashkenazi Jews, um, but for example, quinoa, there was a push to make quinoa not permitted by Ashkenazi Jews. It was a debate, but for the most part now, um, it's not universal, but most have accepted it. So it's very easy to allow for um, quinoa. Hummus, I could see um, hummus being adopted by the Ashkenazi world, particularly in Israel. Uh, Lynn's very excited about that. It's that'd be a little bit more difficult. But again, this is one of the funny, funny things about, uh, you know, the chicken or the egg, which comes first, is it's not a lot, you're not allowed to change a communal custom until it's already changed. So what right. usually- They are wagging the dog. Exactly, but re the reality, which is uh, important for those who study sociology, um, is that what usually happens is the people just start doing it anyways. The rabbis be darned. They just start doing the practice. And then after a generation, the rabbis go back, they justify the people, particularly Ashkenazi rabbis, as I mentioned earlier in class, they justify what the people have done, and then it's fine. Um, and, and particularly again in the Hasidic movement, which today seems so like, you know, classical, old school, set in their ways. And, you know, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. No, not. It's an incredibly new and incredibly revolutionary set of practices. But Hasidic Jewry, in a lot of ways, did that. They did all of these quite controversial things. They were the reformers of their time. Um, I don't think they would appreciate being called that, but they were. And they did really controversial things. But eventually, they just did it. Even though all the rab, not all, but many rabbis said, you, you are excommunicating you, it's absolutely forbidden. They were being screamed at from all sides, but they just did it. And once you have millions of millions of Jews doing something, it's hard to say it's not the custom anymore. So at the end of the day, regardless of all these rules, if people just do something, it's gonna happen. Four is, we talked about this from the very beginning, if you move to a place that has a different custom, other than specific family ones, as long as there's no contradiction, you just change it. And, and in America, as we saw, that doesn't really apply. When I moved from Los Angeles to New York to Baltimore to Milwaukee, you know, my customs have pretty much same, stay, uh, stayed the same. And the last one is how do you change a family custom? You change families. Typically, it's when a woman marries into a man's family. But he even mentioned there are times when a man will change his practice. Usually, it's if he doesn't really have a strong tradition. But I would, I would argue that for Shalom Bayit and for the sake of unifying the family strength, there might be room to adjust some customs. So now I come back to our original question. This Pesach, if I decide I want to eat rice this year, can I do it? Can I just decide that I want to start, I want to change my custom and start eating rice? And you can look at that one through five again and just yeah, kind of glance I, I over. I don't think you have a comp compelling reason. You haven't married into a family. You haven't, you know, it's not common in your 
in your community, none of those things. Now, I think in Israel, eventually, it will become very common because there's plenty of intermarriage between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. And at some point, uh, you know, it, it won't, uh, Tamar can maybe agree or disagree, but it would seem to me that it, it's inevitable that it's going to be very common among all different Israelis. Which is why I mentioned hummus when I was in Pesach in Israel. When you went in, there was they just had hummus. It was kosher for Pesach hummus. It was extra check, but just hummus on the hummus on the shelf. And I had to double check because it said specifically um, not for. It said in Hebrew, it's not for those who don't eat kidney oat. I, it's not for Ashkenazim. Right. Um, so I think that will change. And by the way, one thing I didn't include in this conversation because there's so much more cool stuff. And again, this is really fresh, like relevant stuff right now. There are great Israeli Sephardic rabbis who said that the custom of the land of Israel should be Sephardic often pointing specifically to Rambam and his Mishnah Torah and saying that any Jew who moves to Israel, or certainly a Jew who converts in Israel, and there's a whole other conversation about someone converting and what a custom should they adopt. And typically it's whatever the Beit Din you're adopting is, or presumably what community you're, you're converting into. Um, but many uh, Sephardic rabbis say, if you move to Israel, certainly convert in Israel, you gotta be Sephardic. Now that's not what's done on the ground. And those rabbis have had their ego issues, but um, the question about uh, communal identity, Rav Moshe says there's no communal identity in America. As you just pointed out, Jane, in Israel, there's not a unified one, but there could be. Um, and it's much more, it's much complicated and clear there, depending on how you look at it. Um, and perhaps you could go even city by city. Um, there are probably more Sephardic cities in Israel where I could choose to live and become a Sephardic Jew fully. Um, there is, so there is a reality where I could eat rice um, on Pesach, um, but not in the States. I don't think there are any, uh, maybe in, in Los Angeles, in the Valley, there's some communities that are like all like Iranian Jews and Persian Jews. But again, reality in America, it's much more complicated. So to the question of, can I wake up tomorrow, this Pesach, and do Hatarat Nedarim and change so I could eat rice on Pesach? The simple answer is no. Are there ways to do it? Yes, but not for Joel Dinan. So this year I will continue to enjoy my potatoes. Um, but again, this conversation is constant and it's relevant about how you pray, about how you practice. But I love that Rabbi Malamed emphasized and Rabbi Gil student as well. At the end of the day, yes, it is about God. It certainly it is about God, most of all. God above, then community, and then the legal implications of it. And those are the underlying questions. Will this allow me to connect to God? Does this connect me to my community? And if the answer to either of those questions are no, then it may be time for a potential um, change in custom in one's midhag.